great to see so many people in the room in such a beautiful day outside. I know it's not easy coming to be indoors on such a wonderful day. Um, it's the last event of a very, very busy year. I counted, I think we did 35 events this year, and this is the last. And so we're drawing all the way until the end of the year, so it's great to see that momentum, not only hasn't it fizzled out, we're ending with a highlight, which is fantastic. It's our annual Flatley Lecture, which is one of our two titled lectures, and we're greatly honored to have today with us uh, Professor Alvin Jackson from Edinburgh. Uh, Alvin Jackson is no stranger to BC. In fact, quite a few people remember him long before I was here. I'm, I'm just here two years. For those who don't know, my name is Guy Viner. I'm the Sullivan Chair of Irish Studies. Um, but Alvin was a Burns Fellow many years ago, where I think we were trying to remember how many years ago, but we won't put you to show you that. It was a good, one of the first Burns, one of the first series of Burns Scholars. And he's had a good contact with um, with, with BC since I think you also did a low, didn't you as well? I did. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. So, you, um, so, so uh, Alvin's been around and has honoured us with his presence quite a few times. For those who don't know the work of Alvin Jackson, um, he is, I'd say, at the very top of political history in Ireland in Irish history, and that's interesting enough because political history used to be what everybody did in history, not only in Ireland but in general. And political historians are harder to find nowadays. Would you agree with that, Alvin? I'm not sure. It's not, it's not the same. Uh, I think we're becoming an endangered species. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and Alvin is, is, is at the top of a field which is central to history, and yet kind of people have diverged into, into other directions. And as a student who came to UCD after you'd left, you were already a lecturer then at the time, um, my introduction, one of my important introductions to, to Irish history was exactly the Ireland 1798-1998 in its first edition. Um, and you can feel already then the rigor of the scholarship. It's a book which is full of detail and demands. It doesn't make any compromises. You have to step up all the time and look up names and understand and follow everything as you go along as it leads you through a political history of two centuries, detail by detail. And it's a classic textbook which I think many historians have been trained on and many students of history. So it was the introduction for many of us for kind of a rigorous understanding of modern Ireland. Um, since then, Alvin has also edited the, the handbook of, of uh, the kind of the Oxford of Modern Ireland. So he's kind of looked over the field. But Alvin, his work, as I at least know it, has always been as the historian who is the leading expert on issues of the union and unionism, which is not as obvious as it seems because quite often historians would go towards nationalism. It's not that you haven't engaged always with nationalism, but by being the leading expert on unionism, it forced people always to kind of realign and think their own positions, where they stand in relation to unionism, because it's too easy in many ways to write the history of Ireland just through the prism of nationalism. A lot of histories have been written through that prism. And writing about the union, unionists, the union, uh, writing about the union in comparison to Scotland as being very important, writing about home rule, which is of course the biggest challenge to unionists in the late 19th century. Um, and so, and even, there was that great book uh, comparing Redmond and Carson, where you kind of, the, the Royal Irish Academy book, which I remember, took the two figures, these kind of two leaders, uh, and Carson you've written about in many cases. I remember this great uh, article in, in Past and Present about the, the leading kind of um, mythological figures for a student of memory. That's, that's highly influential. But we're here to mark, I think, in a way, almost a new departure, a new phase in, 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 uh, in, in Alvin Jackson's career, and that's this remarkable book, United Kingdoms. Because Alvin has always looked at, like I said, in great detail at political history, and has looked at comparisons all the time. But this is a book which is all about comparative history. And to take this notion of united kingdoms, not just the United Kingdom, which Alvin has always looked around at Scotland and a bit at Wales even before that, but moving beyond those parameters. And certainly when you delve into this book, it all seems to fall in place that the comparative is not just a modern historian looking for comparatives to understand things from a perspective, but it's a contemporary discourse. A discourse which shortly after the Act of Union, when it's passed in 1801, a series of unions are formed. The union between Sweden and Norway. The union between Brazil and Portugal. Algarves, but Brazil and Portugal is, is the main one. And the union of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Holland and Belgium. Now some of these are short-lived and they're all in the context of the Napoleonic Wars. What surprised me in reading this book is how much the key people behind the Act of Union, particularly Castle Ray, and a clique of people around him were influential in forming all these other unions, exporting this model elsewhere as the solution which set a whole new agenda, political agenda for the 19th century. And then we can see the 19th century, we can reread it as kind of the rise and fall of these unions. Looking at other models as we go along, we can look, for example, 
at Alvin Travels in his book also overseas, for those who want a transatlantic perspective, and what happens in Canada in the years between kind of the, the United Province of Canada from uh, the 1840s, I think it's 1841 till 1867, before it becomes a federation. Or if we want afterwards to follow Austro-Hungary and the dual monarchy of 1867 to 1918, all of these models, and to see how constantly Britain is looking at these models, comparing them, People who are challenging the Union are looking at them at the same time. The famous cases, of course, Austro-Hungary, we all know about Arthur Griffith, but many others. How Gladstone, this key figure in trying to reform and change the Union and adapt it to bring in home rule, um, is looking constantly at European models. Alvin also shows that he's perhaps misreading them historically in different cases, but for a certain purpose. And that's remarkable. So this kind of model challenges to think about it. And what's remarkable, I think, also in this book, is how Alvin, uh, how Alvin afterwards analyzes this in terms of, I think using terms I first encountered them by Thomas Fransk, uh, this kind of centripetal and centrifugal forces, forces that bring the union together, and then forces that take it apart. And we can see how they move, the shifts between them, which is an interesting way of looking at the end, at the whole of the 19th century, but particularly at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century these challenges, where there's always alternatives. So you look to federalism as an alternative which is being floated and to see how it works. And in the end, the book ends with thoughts on this decline of this model of the fall, the end of this age of union, if we wish. And even though the book is interestingly dated, I think from 1800 to 1801 to 1925, interestingly 1925, not 1921, 1925, I assume, particularly because of the boundary informed between Northern Ireland uh, for mid with the Republic, with, not the Republic, with, with the Irish Free State, um, but also an interesting date for Welsh nationalism, which you bring in uh, kind of a new phase. But it makes us constantly think that if the book ends in 1925, we have echoes reading it now from 2024, as we look at Northern Ireland and its relationship with the United Kingdom, which is the last legacy of the Union of 1800 in its changed shape from 1921, 22, uh, and at the same time at Scotland, at the same time at Wales, as well as a point that you make that after a union dissolves and breaks, new kind of internal unions and fusions are formed. Mm. So what kind of union would be created if the United Kingdom would break? What would that mean in terms of Northern Ireland and United Ireland? It would be a different kind of union. Not a United Kingdom, but a different kind of union. So it's remarkably current even as we look at this uh, historical perspective. And for that, we have Alvin to introduce us to the whole topic. Thank you very much. Goodness, what a wonderful introduction. Uh, what a wonderfully stimulating uh, 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 synopsis of uh, some of the key arguments of the book. Um, I almost want to set aside my script. I might be better setting aside my script and engaging just with the variety of points that uh, the guy has so eloquently and so uh, uh, directly uh, put before. But let me just take uh, you know this idea that he concluded upon uh, about the kind of the paradoxical shifting of the notion of union and the contemporary relevance of some of this stuff, the contemporary resonance of some of this stuff, and let me just simply pose a question. What will um, a reunified Ireland look like? Uh, uh, in my view, a reunified Ireland might well be, and this is going to be one of the supreme paradoxes, I think, of contemporary uh, uh, Irish history and politics. A reunified Ireland might well be a reformulated union state a reformulated multinational union state binding together those within the North who hitherto have embraced uh, uh, their Britishness with the mainstream Irish national tradition in the south and west of Ireland. So uh, the supreme sort of end of Irish history might conceivably be a reformulated union. <laughs> It's uh, an enormous pleasure to be back here. Uh, as Guy has said, my connection with BC dates back, um, oh my goodness, it dates back nearly 30 years uh, when uh, I uh, came to BC uh, as Burns Scholar back in the 1990s. Uh, I should say immediately that I was appointed as a teenager to the Burns Scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> um, BC, I've regarded as my academic home from home for that near 30-year period. 
uh, I am absolutely tenacious in my belief and conviction that BC and this Irish Studies program together have been enormous forces for good within uh, uh, the island of Ireland, uh, particularly within my own part of the island, the north, and also for the Irish-British uh, uh, relationship. Hugely grateful to, uh, uh, to the BC community. I'm grateful to my friends, to Guy, as I say, for that wonderful introduction, to uh, my old friend, Rob Savage. Uh, I'm grateful to Oliver Rafferty uh, for his hospitality uh, uh, this weekend, uh, and I'm grateful to the Consul General, the British Consul General, I'm not sure whether he's uh, here or not, but he and the Consulate, I think, are co-sponsoring this event. The Flatley Bequest is the other sponsor, and I gratefully acknowledge uh, their contribution to uh, our event this afternoon. Uh, I had the privilege some years ago of meeting uh, Tom Flatley, uh, 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 whose name has been given to this lecture series, uh, and who at that time was both a benefactor of BC as well as uh, a trustee of the college. So my particular purpose this afternoon is to introduce some themes from this book of mine that Guy has very kindly referenced. Uh, and the book and the project uh, upon which it is based seeks to reflect upon the Irish Union in the 19th century and occasionally upon the wider unions of the United Kingdom, but doing this in a broad comparative perspective. And I'm suggesting a range of arguments uh, and some questions. Uh, I don't always have answers. Um, so I'm suggesting a range of arguments and questions in a necessarily compressed way given uh, the constraints of time. Uh, but let me outline first where I'm hoping to go with all of this. If I can get my PowerPoint working. Now, this is where uh, I'm afraid those of you who went straight to the back seats are going to be punished. <laughs> and, and rightly so, um, uh, because uh, uh, the print is, uh, is going to be a little bit too small for you. But don't worry, uh, I'm going to hopefully work through this in uh, uh, what I hope will be a, a passably rigorous way. So the four points that are on screen uh, and uh, which the deserving part of the company can see at the front of the room, four points are that while we think of the Irish Revolution and partition in terms of wider models, links and analogies, we don't actually place the Irish Union in similar perspective. And in fact, I'd argue that Ireland should be seen as being both defined by and defining outside instances of union relationships and union states. And linked with this, uh, and the second point on screen, is a sense in which Ireland, or at any rate, Irish landed elites, may be seen as exporting union in the early 19th century, just as Ireland has been seen as exporting revolution in the 20th. And more generally, and just to take up uh, uh, a point that uh, Guy has uh, uh, highlighted, more generally, 19th century contemporaries writing on Ireland or writing within Ireland uh, naturally define the Irish Union in terms of comparators. This takes us way beyond those that are usually name-checked uh, uh, and Gladstone and Griffith in particular. Or putting this another way, many naturally interpreted the map of Europe within the framework of the Irish Union. And lastly, I'd suggest that if those who experienced union in the 19th century often thought about it in comparative terms, then actually so should we. Understanding both the relative longevity and the ultimate failure of the Irish Union continue to be, in my view, illuminated in fresh ways by pursuing a, a sustained comparative analysis. So that's the agenda, uh, and let me take each of these points uh, in turn. The first of them is uh, uh, that while we think of the Irish Revolution and partition in terms of wider models, we don't do the same for the, for the Union. Well, in the aftermath of the centenaries associated with the achievement of Irish independence and with partition, we've come to define 
both of these in comparative terms and against wider models or exemplars. So we think now uh, in terms of partition by referencing the Middle East, Palestine, and also South Asia. We look at uh, partition uh, as not just uh, a particular Irish experience, but an imperial model. And we conventionally think of the Irish Revolution in terms of export, looking at the influence of Irish revolutionaries and their contribution, directly or indirectly, to a wide variety of liberation struggles in the era of decolonization. But I'm also proposing uh, this afternoon the perhaps counterintuitive notion that Ireland not only exported revolution, it also exported union. There was indeed a proliferation of the uh, idea and the nomenclature of the United Kingdom during uh, uh, the conflict with Napoleonic France and at its conclusion. Now, we as historians tend to focus in this period in terms of the restoration or consolidation of empire and on the construction of the nation state, but this was also an age of union for multinational and sometimes self-styled United Kingdoms were created in the course of less than 15 years. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, the United Kingdoms, plural, of Sweden, Norway, and the short-lived United Kingdom of Portugal, Brazil, and the uh, Algarves. And this was a, a, an era which saw the revitalization in 1804 and then later in the century, in 1867, of that complex composite monarchy or union of crowds that was the Austrian Empire. Polity very much at the heart of British diplomacy across the 19th century and one whose subsequent fate and recalibration proved to be of significant interest to Irish observers. And this was also an era wherein Union was exported uh, within the British Empire, uh, as Guy has uh, rightly mentioned, including to Canada. Uh, and the United Canadas in 1840-1841 drew upon the Irish and Scots experience of Union. And they drew upon the personnel, in some cases, that had immediate uh, uh, experience of those Union relationships. So these were generally polities which had begun <coughs> life as composite monarchies or as personal unions, that is to say uh, uh, unions of the crown under a single monarch, and which later developed into an array of different forms of multinational and <coughs> as I've suggested sometimes specifically designated United Kingdom. They were polities which were clearly rooted in the wider politics of the World War of 1793-1815. They were polities which were otherwise interlinked, being created not only at roughly the same time, at the time as I'm saying, but sometimes even by the direct input of British foreign and imperial policy. And this takes me to a second point or question, which is, in what ways does the Irish Union connect externally uh, uh, at this time? Well, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, through uh, especially its Foreign Secretary, Castlereagh, uh, who's in office between 1812 and 1822, Castlereagh and his lieutenants, these were central to the origins of the early preservation of this network of union polities. Now, this is not to suggest that these British and Irish elites at this time invented a union or that they had exclusive rights over the concept. Uh, one only has to think uh, immediately about the Scottish Union of 1707 to realise this. But it is to say that some of the key architects of the United Kingdom emerged as influential promoters and defenders of other union polities in the early 19th century. Generally, as with the Irish Union, with security, and in particular with the French or other great power threats, all very firmly in mind. So, for example, the great historian of international relations uh, uh, in Britain uh, of the early 20th century, Sir Charles Webster, writing in 1931, described 
the United uh, Kingdom of the Netherlands, formed in 1814-15 as being, in his words, of course, the special creation of Britain, and in particular of Castlereagh. It was his insistence alone which deprived France of Belgium. And contemporary British diplomacy also helped significantly to deliver the United Kingdoms of Sweden and Norway, this despite intense Norwegian lobbying uh, in London against the Union. It wasn't just Castlereagh's principles of foreign policy which invoked union, it was also the networks of diplomatic and administrative support which uh, he nurtured. Edward Cook, who's on the top left of this slide, a key architect of the Irish Union, Cook drew up the relevant legislation and he was a critical uh, polemicist, propagandist. Edward Cook followed Castlereagh in his ministerial progression and eventually uh, arrived with his leader to the Foreign Office in 1812. Castlereagh's half-brother, uh, Autumn Wright, uh, was given successive seats in the Irish House of Commons in 1800, where, unsurprisingly, he followed Big Brother's lead and was a proponent of the Irish Union. He was later appointed uh, on Castlereagh's recommendation uh, uh, as British ambassador in Vienna. Lord Clancarty, bottom left, had voted for union in the Irish Parliament in 1800, subsequently emerging as one of Castlereagh's greatest friends and admirers. Clancarty was central in formulating the plan for the incorporation of the Belgian and the Dutch provinces together, unifying uh, into the new state of the Netherlands. Thereafter, he served as the first British ambassador to this new United Kingdom between 1816 and 1823. And other younger Irish peers reflected Castlereagh's landed background, his values, and his outlook, including uh, his unionism. Lord Strangford thought right. The British minister plenipotentiary to Sweden and Norway, the United Kingdoms uh, of Sweden and Norway between 1817 and 1820. And finally, between 1817 and 1819, Castlereagh was served as private secretary by yet another uh, Irish uh, ascendancy figure, um, namely uh, uh, Richard Mead, who was uh, later the uh, Earl of Clan William. And Clan William subsequently became under secretary at the Foreign Office under Castlereagh and served in that role between 1819 and. 1822. So without belaboring the point, uh, I'd suggest that Castlereagh, uh, who of course is center stage here, Castlereagh's diplomatic team disproportionately and unsurprisingly comprised those who shared his own ascendancy background or who had worked with him in the delivery of union in Ireland. So the question arises, uh, did this matter? Did these connections matter? Well, contemporaries certainly thought so. Repeal-minded Irish politicians were initially enraged by British diplomacy in Scandinavia, where they saw Norway uh, as being treated with the same apparent high-handedness which had been applied 14 years earlier to Ireland. And on the other hand, ultra-Protestant Irish opponents of Catholic emancipation interpreted Castlereagh's union building in the Low Countries as being of a piece with his particular ideal of union uh, uh, in relation to Ireland and with his desire to promote uh, a, a link between Catholic emancipation and union. An anonymous conservative uh, polemicist uh, writing at the time of the Belgian Revolution in the early 1830s, writing in the Dublin University magazine, anonymous but uh, possibly uh, 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 Isaac Butt, the later home ruler, who was an orange conservative at this stage, this reviewer interpreted the United Kingdom of the Netherlands as embodying the ideals of civil liberty within an essentially Protestant state which Castlereagh was ostensibly seeking through the Irish Union and the proposed Catholic emancipation of 1800. Now, this particular view was certainly an expression of anti-emancipationist orange suspicion, but it's also clear that the architect and the builders of the Irish Union were influential in realizing this 
new Netherlands, this new United Kingdom of the Netherlands. And it's clear that contemporaries not only saw this connection, but also the possibility of reciprocal influence back from this United Kingdom into Ireland itself. And this takes me to my third point, which is that Irish contemporaries saw union in comparative terms, looking even beyond the traditional default positions of Gladstone and Griffith. So, um, I think that, with some honorable exceptions, Theo Hoppen comes to mind, but there are others. We tend to think of 19th century Irish or Irish-related comment on outside union polities uh, as being, as I've said, a matter of Griffith and the dual monarchy, the resurrection of Hungary, or Gladstone and the exemplars that he uh, identified for home rule. But there were also, ultimately, a sustained set of reciprocities here. Reciprocity of influence and connection that uh, uh, resonated throughout the 19th century. The contemporary Irish and contemporary Britons, politicians, scholars, travelers, saw rich and dense interlinkages connecting the different unions of 19th century Europe and beyond. And from these travels and readings and commentaries, they eventually came to identify exemplars or paradigms for the constitutional reform of the Irish and Scottish relationship within the United Kingdom. Taking first Irish patriots and nationalists, they for long engaged with the history of the multinational union states of continental Europe and beyond, seeking both models as well as warnings. Daniel O'Connell was a close critic of uh, the creation of the United Kingdom of Sweden, Norway in 1814-15, as he was of the creation of the United Canada's in 1840-1841. Repealers more generally sought inspiration both in the Belgian secession from the Netherlands in 1830, as well as uh, uh, finding inspiration in the looseness of the Union relationship that eventually emerged between Norway and Sweden. And there was also, I think, clear communication between Irish repealers and Scottish commentators on the, on the Swedish-Norwegian Union. The work of the Orkneys-born journalist and traveler, the radical Samuel Lang, is particularly relevant in this respect. Lang was a prolific uh, uh, author uh, in the 1830s and 1840s offering uh, a set of commentaries uh, through his travels in Northern Europe, in Norway and Sweden in particular. These were widely circulated in, uh, in Ireland. In September 1844, the Committee of the Repeal Association launched a national essay competition designed to elicit both the most cogent arguments for the ending of union as well as ideas for a successor constitution. The competition specifically required its essayists uh, to, as you can see, illustrate the international relations which they propose shall hereafter subsist between Great Britain and Ireland by examples taken from the history and existing institutions of other countries, and in particular that they should examine how far the constitution of Norway and its connection with Sweden may serve as a model for the new constitution of Ireland. Now, in actual fact, given the Belgian Revolution, which had only comparatively recently occurred, uh, and its outworkings, given that these were more recent events, the uh, demise of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands commanded only a little bit less attention than the request to consider the United Kingdoms of Sweden and Norway, and indeed the eventual winner of the first prize in this repeal competition, this repeal essay competition, who was a barrister called Michael Barry, he actually dwelt not on the uh, uh, suggested or indeed required Scandinavian paradigm, but rather on the Netherlands and the bleak lessons that it adduced uh, uh, for the Irish Union. Indeed, one might see this as a clear example of somebody gaining top marks for answering not the set question on the paper, but the one that they felt should have been asked in the circumstances. <laughs> Barry's purposes were to refute the union, uh, to refute the notion 
that independence had brought disaster to Belgian trade and Belgian uh, uh, manufacturing, and equally to refute pro-union reflections on what unionists were increasingly seeing as the so-called Rome rule developing in Belgium. Other of these literary repealers, for example, uh, Michael Staunton, who was a later Lord Mayor of Dublin, endorsed the conviction, which actually originated uh, uh, within Scottish writing and with the work of Samuel Lang, whom I've, uh, whom I've named Jake, the conviction that unions which were morally or physically discordant, such as those binding Belgium and Holland, and by direct implication Britain and Ireland, that these were political arrangements which lacked any principle of permanency founded upon their benefits. Irish unionists, as we've seen, were closely involved with the shaping of these different union polities. Unionists like the Belfast merchant and politician James Emerson Tennant, uh, writing on the Belgian Revolution of the early uh, uh, 1830s, but writing uh, himself in the early 1840s. Tennant lamented the disillusion of the Netherlands in 1830 as a clear foretaste of the likely disasters of repeal. Others, both Irish and Scots, identified with and eulogized the unionist ambitions of uh, the new king of the United uh, 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 Monarchy of Sweden, Norway, Carl XIV Johan, who was one of the effective patriarchs of this uh, settlement. For Tennant, despite the blunders of the Netherlands king, uh, Willem, the fracturing of the union between Belgium and Holland presented an economic contrast with the burgeoning fortunes of the emerging uh, uh, German Confederation, the unifying German Confederation, and thereby uh, provided a clear premonition of the likely consequences of what repeal might mean for Ireland. The linen and other trades had stalled in his analysis and implying an analogy with Belfast Tennant observed that the merchants of Antwerp and the manufacturers of Ghent had the good sense, probably purchased by experience, to recognize the incontrovertible principle of prosperity and union, and foreseeing clearly the ruin of their pursuits and the results of the repeal of the union with Holland, they loudly protested against the revolutionaries of 1830. So in other words, economic success, whether in Ireland or the Low Countries, hinged upon union. The repudiation of union by the Belgians had produced a, 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 an economic conflagration in tenants' terms. And in fact, there was a sustained Irish and Scots comment throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries on Sweden Norway. And indeed, without getting further into the details of this, I'll simply uh, uh, direct you to the most successful English language biography of uh, Carl XIV Johann of Sweden, Norway, uh, Napoleon's uh, Marshal Bernadotte, which was written, in fact, by a sometime Irish Unionist MP and later uh, United Kingdom judge, D.P. Barton, a multi-volume celebratory biography published <laughs> first against the backdrop of the Third Home Rule Bill in 1914, much reprinted, though now uh, completely forgotten. And turning to Austria and Austria-Hungary, well, Irish engagement here, as we've already noted several times, is defined largely in terms of Arthur Griffith. But of course, Gladstonian liberals and Redmondite nationalists, including John Redmond himself, looked covetously at the Austro-Hungarian Compromise, uh, the Ausgleich of 1867. And as in the early 19th century, so in the early 20th century, there was also Scottish political influence uh, 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 over this debate, which filtered into Ireland. Uh, and one, I think, of the key figures here, uh, who perhaps should be recognised more thoroughly within Irish political historiography, is R. W. Seaton Watson. Prolific Scottish liberal commentator on Central and Eastern Europe, uh, whose life and career interconnected many times with Home Rule and indeed Unionist politics uh, uh, in Ireland. And here indeed he is with uh, Thomas uh, Masaryk. 
More generally, and in an age of dramatically improving communication, there was a long history of cross-fertilization between the national movements of the Austrian and British empires, and indeed between Austrian and British liberalism. The Hungarian sociologist and historian Oskar Jassy, who influentially chronicled the decline of the Habsburgs in the 1920s from his exile in the United States, uh, uh, his exile at Oberlin College in Ohio, observed that the repeal movement of the Irish kindled the fantasy of the struggling Habsburg nations, and that domestic repression within the Austrian Empire, within the Habsburg domain, further encouraged the consideration of Irish politics because it was possible to consider these rather than engage with uh, uh, the domestic scene. And indeed, Irish nationalists, whether constitutionalists or separatists, looked to Central European paradigms as a means of highlighting the difficulties in the British-Irish relationship. The patriot and polemicist Father Thaddeus O'Malley, an ally of Butt, and writing uh, indeed in, in the early 1870s, making the case for federal home rule, uh, argued convincingly that the Compromise, the Austrian Compromise, the Ausgleich of 1867, had given even the unwieldy Habsburgs a fresh long lease of power. And O'Malley was one of a handful of Irish authorities, not just studied and read, but re-read by Gladstone uh, uh, in the 1870s and into the 1880s. And though Arthur Griffith, the effective founder of Sinn Féin, was prominently and lastingly associated with the Hungarian analogy, in fact, other contemporaries, liberals and home rulers, had long pondered the uh, 1867 Compromise and its implications. John Redmond frequently advocated continental, European, and wider exemplars of home rule, or what he described as federalism. Before its final dissolution in 1905, he pointed to Sweden, Norway, as repealers had done before him, as a possible template for a revised British-Irish relationship. Canada, rebellious in the late 1830s, but uh, ostensibly a loyal component of empire by 1900, was <coughs> often cited by Redmond as an example of the advantages of a federal over a unitary constitution. But on critical occasions, such as the debate on Home Rule in 1893, Redmond also specifically highlighted Austria-Hungary as a paradigm for the British and Irish to study and to emulate. Now, of course, it was Griffith who effectively annexed the Hungarian analogy, all the while pouring contempt on Gladstone and Redmond's audacity in misrepresenting their miserably constricted Home Rule as comparable to the real autonomy which he saw being enjoyed by the uh, uh, Hungarians. Griffith was encouraged by the apparently marmorial Habsburg's ability to accommodate themselves to this new dual polity. He was encouraged by the speed with which they moved from absolutist repression to constitutionalist dualism. And he saw here possibilities for uh, the British Empire and for Ireland's relationship with it. Now, as it happens, neither Redmond nor Griffith took on board the critiques of those like Seton Watson uh, uh, on the screen, who in a range of work published before the First World War, highlighted the ways in which the Hungarians uh, actually simultaneously proclaimed their own national needs while once the 1867 compromise was achieved, subverting those of the Croats and other minorities within their half of the Habsburg Empire. It was the case, however, that Seton Watson's uh, work was very widely noticed in the home rule press, and that it stimulated a set of arguments which linked the cases of Ireland with that of Croatia, and actually, and counterintuitively given the preceding uh, uh, arguments, linked Hungary with British rule rather than representing Hungary as a model for Ireland. And though this was certainly a shift from the Gladstonian worldview, it had the merit 
of placing some blue water between the European analogies of Sinn Féin and those uh, of the Home Rule movement. And actually, British and Irish Unionists were similarly divided over their interpretation of these analogies. Purists like the uh, constitutionalist lawyer, A.V. Dicey, repudiated all analogy. For Dicey, uh, it was the exceptionalism, the exceptional luster of the British Union constitution which was key. Edward Carson and his celebrants, however, took a slightly different line. Uh, Carson, as it happens, was relatively close politically to Seton Watson. Uh, they worked together uh, during the First World War. And Carson uh, uh, shared Seton Watson's uh, northern and southern Slav sympathies during the First World War. And it seems to me that Carson's, uh, Edward Carson's dalliance with federal reform of the United Kingdom, which is sometimes either overlooked or treated as, uh, as a feint, uh, uh, as a bluff, Carson's dalliance with federalism wasn't perhaps in, was perhaps influenced by his uh, relationship with Seaton Watson, for whom a federal and complex reform of the Austrian Empire was the way uh, forward. So, in short, the story of the unions of the United Kingdom, and especially the Irish, has been closely associated with a didactic history of political engagement and comparison, which extends far beyond the reference points normally cited within the literature. And more specifically, the story of these unions has always been associated with continental European uh, uh, analogy and comparison. So I've been thinking so far about what the experience of other multinational union polities meant for Irish contemporaries across the 19th and 20th centuries. But if the experience of complex polities like Austria and Hungary had meaning for these contemporaries, what meaning might its history and its historiography have for those of us now, and especially those of us reflecting on the uh, Irish Union with Britain. So with all of this mind, in mind, let me make a, a, a number of final suggestions. The first of these, I think, relates to the notion of longevity. So the scholarship on the dual monarchy in particular, and to a lesser extent some other union polities that I've invoked, Increasingly emphasizes now uh, longevity and contingency. Work on the dual monarchy and on the Ausgleich over at least the past 25 or 30 years eschews teleologies of irresistible failure. This work has a number of focal points, uh, but the most obvious recent one, and certainly the most well known recent focal point of this, is Peter Judson's formidable. Overview of the Habsburg Empire published by Harvard in 2016. In other words, the meta narrative for Habsburg Europe has shifted from how it grew ever more diseased and then naturally died. The uh, journalist Wickham Steed in the 1930s talked about the doom of the Habsburgs. The meta narrative has shifted from this to instead how it adapted and lingered and held all. That takes me to the notion of malleability. All this has partly involved an emphasis upon the themes of malleability and survival, themes which I think of irrelevance for Ireland and the Irish Union. These polities often possessed, for better or for worse, an inner sturdiness anchored in buttressing institutions and agencies, and they benefited as well from some divided loyalties and uh, uh, just as often popular passivity turn to that theme in a moment. As Wickham Steed uh, said of the dual monarchy, Wickham Steed is one of the most prominent uh, English journalists writing in the era before the First World War on uh, the Habsburgs. As Wickham Steed said of the dual monarchy in 1913, in uh, judging the affairs of the Habsburg monarchy, it's easy to underestimate its hidden powers of resistance, its secret vitality, and the half unconscious dynastic cohesion of its peoples. For these 
Forces and qualities, full alliance must always be made, even though the signs of their existence be overshadowed by symptoms of decrepitude and disintegration. Now, like many journalists and like many historians, uh, Steed later changed his tune after the uh, collapse of the monarchy in 1918. But his comment, I think, uh, from this period before the war, 1913-1914, might uh, uh, be applied uh, to the unions of the United Kingdom. Both were often malleable polities which proved adaptable within certain constraints and limitations to the challenges and exigencies of threat and change. The semi-confessional incorporating union of Britain and Ireland of 1800 developed substantially across the span of the long 19th century, gradually retreating from its oppressive uh, church establishment, gaining new electorates and effectively shedding by the 1880s and afterwards uh, an old and deeply contested pattern of land ownership. And similarly, Austria, Hungary, and in particular, the western half of the empire, Cisleithania, Austria, it was called, proved able to generate stimulating new strategies to answer the challenges of class and of nationality, whether through expanding enfranchisement or through the new provincial constitutional settlements in places like provinces like Moravia and Galicia. These settlements uh, were mooted uh, before 1914. And uh, at the risk of going uh, uh, Harry Potter and Hogwarts on you, I'd suggest <laughs> that the idea of the dark arts of imperial rule is relevant, binding uh, these analogies. The dual monarchy survived because its governments in Vienna and Budapest perfected strategies in the Austrian case of identifying and promoting favored nationalities, dividing and ruling, encouraging exclusive communication, not between different uh, minority populations or different national populations, but rather between them directly with the imperial center. Um, they didn't want Serbs talking with Croats. With Hungary, our policies of cultural and political magyarization were associated with highly exclusive electorates and the vigorous promotion of Hungarian. Austrian or Cisleithanian government in the early 20th century pursued policies which were essentially forms of constructive unionism, what we Irish historians would call constructive unionism, buying off dissent often through material concession. In both halves of the empire there were instances of bloody confrontation between state forces and protesters, of state violence and repression. There was evidence of the state's manipulation of the judicial process, the, the most infamous example of this in the late 19th, early 20th centuries were the Agra and the Zagreb treason trials of 1908. In short, the dual monarchy survived partly because it practiced some of the dark arts of imperial rule. And much of this is familiar to those of us who are Irish historians. The identification and suppression of favored, uh, or the identification and supersession of favored elites or ruling partners. Hierarchies of official favor, the attempted conversion of cultural or political protest into the currency of material reform. State violence and the manipulation of the judicial process, as in Austria Hungary, played their part. If uh, England and the English people were the dominant uh, uh, nationality of the United Kingdom, uh, then the Scots arguably enjoyed a favored nation status, certainly in terms of the attitudes of the British monarchy, as well as access to the governing elite. And at the same time, the dual monarchy was a layering and a complex layering at that of relatively advantaged nations with the Germans and the Austrians at the top, but with Galician Poles, and at least in constitutional theory, if not in practice, the Croats also featuring in the hierarchies of privilege. Moreover, the United Kingdom represented the patriotic feeling of the Scots and the Welsh much, much more effectively than the Irish. And a key issue with the Irish Union from the get-go was the extent to which in Ireland, distinctive national institutions 
which in other parts of the UK might have served as bolsters of union, in fact, in Ireland promoted unpopular minority ascendancy interests and thus encouraged divergence between the two islands. Institutions, well, Wickham stayed uh, in that quote, um, references this to some extent, and it's long been accepted from the writing of commentators like him, Seton Watson, Oscar Yassi, and others whom I've, uh, whom I've uh, referenced. It's long been accepted from these that the dual monarchy survived because it possessed essential institutional support for some of the time. Though Yassi also uh, emphasized that there were key fluidities and that, as Guy mentioned, uh, in his kind introduction, that centripetal forces could well become centrifugal forces, that uh, one can start off uh, uh, with an analytical dichotomy between these two, but one has to move beyond that. The mid-19th century Austrian revolutionary, medic, and uh, political writer Adolf Fischoff famously defined four supportive Habsburg armies, the standing army, the military, the sitting army, the bureaucracy, the crawling army, the secret police, and the kneeling army, the clergy of the church. <laughs> Imperial and royal armies have often served to provide unifying agencies for the different peoples of uh, complex states. So at the same time, it would be wrong to attempt an even really crude correlation. An expanding state with concomitant overarching bureaucracies has sometimes served to deepen the links between its people uh, and the Union itself. And different historians, Bob Harris, Pat Joyce within British historiography, dwell on the role of the post office, for example, and its expansion in the 19th century in this respect. Though it's also the case, I think, that dynamic unions of this kind may grow and strengthen while simultaneously invoking failure through disrupting established social frontiers and firing nationalist pushback and opposition. And again, to revert to Oscar Yassi, in all of these cases, strongly centripetal institutions have the simultaneous capacity to act centrifugally. Identities. Well, the dual monarchy survived at least in part because it could rely upon either the passivity or the disinterest of parts of its population, including those who have been identified within recent work by uh, Jeremy King, who I think uh, uh, is at Mount Holyoke, Tara Tsara, Chicago, and Peter Judson, whom I've mentioned already. These historians have talked about non-national communities. And unions certainly lacked or failed to produce overarching or binding identities. Now, as is well known, the dual monarchy never generated an effective Austro-Hungarianness. This too was the case in Sweden and Norway, where citizens were either Norwegians or Swedes, but never Swedish Norwegian. There was a supranational Scandinavianist movement in the mid 19th century, but uh, it uh, withered after the 1860s, and in any event, it included Denmark and, uh, uh, and Finland uh, as well. And in the UK, while there was a single citizenship and a single passport, and while there was Britishness, this, with its emphases, we know from Linda Colley on Protestantism and the island of Britain itself, this didn't embrace Ireland or Irishness. In each of these different unions, there were compensating dynastic loyalties to the houses of Habsburg and Bernadotte and Hanover, and eventually after 1917, Windsor. These could and sometimes did work to create ties to the Union state, including sometimes even ties between Ireland and the Union State, but there were other, uh, but these were often identities or loyalties which were vulnerable to shifts within the different ruling houses and in the credibility and standing of their crowned heads. Moreover, multinational Union States often harbored significant communities who didn't strongly identify with any single uh, nationality or nationalism, but who were instead characterized primarily by a binding supranational dynastic uh, or other mold. And much has been made of this Habsburg identity within recent Habsburg historiography. But there's a case, I think, for applying the concept of dynastic identity elsewhere, including within the unions of the UK. 
And it may be that these and other non-national communities within the dual monarchy and of the United Kingdom are to be identified with the hybridities associated with identity inside colonial frameworks. And this would certainly make sense in terms of the conceptual overlap between notions of union and empire. But ultimately, I can only pose the question uh, uh, this afternoon rather than, uh, uh, rather than definitively resolving it. Equally important across these European unions is the role of unionism in the failure of union, the influence and impact of those ostensible supporters of union. Now, at one level, this is the unremarkable story of unionists within dominant nationalities seeking at times to enforce their influence, sometimes oppressively, over so-called subordinate partners. But, and linked with the previous point, unions have failed or have been decisively weakened because unionists have either disengaged or realigned, as was the case really with Sweden and Norway by the last years of the existence of the United Kingdom. Or, in some cases, unionists have actually actively undermined the ostensible object of their desire. Centralizing elites within Austria during the First World War helped to loosen the bonds of loyalty within the monarchy through both their increasingly oppressive governance and through a related lack of faith in the monarchy's constituent nationalities. It was more the ruling elite that lost faith in its peoples rather than the other way around. Lawrence Cole of Salzburg has suggested. And in the United Kingdom before the war, Irish and British Unionists aggressively challenged some of the central binding institutions of their beloved Union state, arguing in 1912-1914 that Home Rule Liberals had unfairly changed the uncodified rules of the British constitutional game. Unionists in Ireland and in Britain looked set to subvert Parliament the army and even actually the monarchy. That is to say, British and Irish unionists effectively sought to uphold and to define union to, through the destruction of its central institutions. And in a sense, if I can uh, mangle that famous line from Tacitus's Agricola, they were threatening to create a desert and call it union. And lastly, global warfare. Well, created in very particular circumstances, created often against the backdrop of global warfare, these multinational unions were often susceptible to changed contingency and context. Born in warfare, they were vulnerable to the traumatic impact of the global conflict of 1914-18. Whether as vanquished powers, like the dual monarchy, or even as victors, in the case of the United Kingdom, war proved uniquely damaging to the complex cultures of negotiation and arbitration, which had otherwise been at least partly successful in sustaining Austria-Hungary up to 1914. Habsburg historians now frequently highlight the rapid imposition of the military state after 1914, the relegation of the reformist programs which had promised heightened local autonomy in various of the crown lands before the outbreak of the war. And by extension, it is possible to see the Irish-British Union's failure as being related to the consolidation of the British military state, martial law, the threat of conscription, and also the evaporation of that malleability which had characterized particularly liberal governments' track records in the years before 1914. Unions, including the Irish Union, depended for their survival upon this malleability, their fleet-footedness, and war tended to eliminate the wriggle room necessary for this kind of political athletics. So how can I uh, draw the, uh, the skeins of this uh, 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 together? Well, let me invoke an episode from October uh, 1988. In that month, uh, Otto von Habsburg and Ian Paisley came to blows. 
It came to blows during uh, Ian Paisley's protest against a papal visit to the uh, European Parliament at Strasbourg. And in a richly, uh, well, to my mind, a richly symbolic exchange, the uh, head of the House of Habsburg, the eldest son of the last emperor king, Karl, threw a punch, it was alleged, at the ferocious Ulster pastor who had earlier heckled and insulted Pope John Paul II. This has been described wittily, but not entirely accurately, as uh, uh, the most important Habsburg intervention in Ulster since the Nine Years' War. <laughs> <laughs> Complex multinational polities and traditions such as those represented by the Habsburgs, but not only those, have long been important to the Irish and to the history of the Irish Union. Irish Unionists helped to shape a pattern of multinational polities in wartime and post-war Europe in the early 19th century. Irish nationalists thought carefully about the shape and direction of multinational European and wider polities across the century and saw manifold possibilities for a reformed or a recalibrated Irish Union. The history and literature on all of these polities should have a much greater resonance within Ireland and Britain than is currently the case, and its emphases and its directions should help to illuminate the Irish Union in fresh ways and to encourage a representation of the uh, Union state which fully captures its contexts, its complexities, its constrictions, and its constraints. So in short, the Habsburgs ought indeed to exercise a punch, but upon Irish historians as much as Ian Paisley. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty or so minutes for, for questions. So please, uh, Alvin, I think you can call upon people where you are. Yes, indeed, I can. Uh, uh, I can happily do this. Let's see. Yes, Claire. Thank you so much, Alvin. I've just been reading uh, that James Stafford book, The Case of Ireland, which is the kind of thing you can do when you're a brand scholar, as you know. Which is my book. Um, and I was really taken with what he said about how. Um, the, in 19th century Europe, the case of Ireland was understood so widely as a kind of test for what the British Empire was doing or said it was doing or achieving and, and so on. And you have expanded my mind much further in, in understanding the kind of internal politics of, um, uh, across, uh, across Europe. And what I'm wondering, I suppose, is to what extent did um, the other context you're talking about in the Austro-Hungarian case or um, in Norway and Sweden, uh, did anyone actually look westward or backwards to union as mechanism or union as kind of stroke of policy? It was so good at the start when you were talking about capital ray and the kind of transferability of union as mode, if you like. Uh, and did that particular kind of aspect of union come into view in later discussions or did it become sort of um, submerged into the kind of existing state of things. So like in, in the Stafford book, it seems that everyone is, for, for much of the 19th century, poor, restive, hungry, unhappy, on top of Ireland. And that's why, you know, if you're Engels or just after Goma or whatever, you go to Ireland and walk around and have a look. Um, but yeah, to, to what extent did the actual mechanism of union come into focus? Um. I'm not sure, Claire, that I'm uh, understanding the question uh, 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 absolutely. No, no, not at all. Um, but let me uh, let me take what I understand to be your direction of travel, and if I'm uh, getting off piste, as it were, you can uh, you can uh, uh, you can bring me back. So I think that. Um, um, I think clearly at one level uh, uh, the detailed uh, constructions or mechanisms of union uh, uh, have uh, have a lasting uh, uh, 
um, importance and influence. Um, and uh, a variety of the individuals whom I've name-checked look specifically at the, if you like, the mechanical construction of a variety of these overseas polities and seek to apply the lessons from that insight uh, to the uh, to the case of the UK uh, Constitution and Ireland uh, specifically. What's interesting uh, uh, is the extent to which um, there is uh, a huge amount of uh, wishful thinking and, and tunnel vision in this exercise. So to some extent uh, I sought to allude to this uh, a little bit. So the Hungarian analogy is uh, very frequently deployed, but it's only really in the period after 1908 that through the work of Seton Watson, uh, whom I name referenced, and whose work was widely read in Ireland, at least of the review literature is, uh, uh, is a judge. Seton Watson's big idea was the extent to which the Hungarians were uh, proactively constricting the national minorities in their uh, eastern half of the empire through uh, um, fancy franchises, fancily constricted franchises, and through active programs of magyarization. But it's only really through the publication of a succession of work by Seton Watson that the mechanics of this particular kind of complex polity are more fully understood in Ireland, and it's only uh, then that a variety of, of home rulers, thoughtful home rulers within the patriotic press of that era take this material on board and uh, begin, I think, to put some blue water, see this as an opportunity to put some blue water between them and the, uh, uh, what they see as the uncritical insights of Griffith on Austria-Hungary and the resurrection of Hungary published, as you know, in 1904, but reprinted subsequently. So um, uh, one way of answering your question, I suppose, is to, uh, uh, um, is to suggest that there's a certain tunnel vision or purblindness when it comes to the mechanisms of these other uh, overseas union polities and the way in which these are transferred into the Irish and British scene. And, Gl and Gladstone is, uh, is a wonderful example of uh, of a politician who is um, uh, susceptible to confirmation bias, as we would describe it, uh, and uh, does not want evidence that does not fit his overall thesis, which is that Sweden and Norway is absolutely, a gloriously uh, 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 well-matched and balanced and calm and fraternal union, um, and he gets feedback from uh, his diplomatic representatives, the Consul General, uh, uh, who I don't think is here, uh, uh, but the British Consul General and Christy Anya uh, in Norway at that time, feeds back information to Gladstone saying that uh, uh, there are tremendous tensions in terms of the trading relationship between these two ostensible partners. Uh, uh, the correspondence in the Gladstone papers wherein this hapless diplomat is rubbished because he's given the wrong message about the mechanics of this particular union quality, that kind of vitriol has to be seen to be Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hey, thank you so much. Um, this was absolutely fantastic talk. I, I really appreciate hearing this. I, I study inner war Austria, so this was a really nice treat to, to, to learn more about this. I was wondering, um, I have two questions. One, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, so I, I completely agree with the kind of historiography that criticizes the teleological kind of death narrative of um, dual water. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about perhaps even more largely in society about like kind of nostalgia or like over romanticization of the kind of dual monarchy period or perhaps the ways in which it's sort of loosely seen as a a potential model for like supranational organizations like the EU, that kind of thing, this sort of loose comparison that goes on. Um, and the second question was, I was really fascinated about this, the extent to which with Austria-Hungary you have Hungary itself also being an imperializing entity, right? And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about specifically the 
first decision to, well, that's both, but administer and then annex Bosnia and Herzegovina, that would really kind of polarize Europe and make sense to which this, how it may be seen or received in Ireland as well. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, uh, thank you so much for those two uh, really, really uh, important and stimulating questions. Uh, they open up uh, enormously interesting and vast territory, so let me do my best to respond to you. Um, so the issue of nostalgia, which is your first point, um, well, um, the, uh, it seems to me that uh, I'm coming uh, as an Irish historian to the, uh, to the historiography of Central Europe and indeed these other historiographies. Uh, so um, uh, I, uh, uh, that must be borne in mind. But it seems to me that uh, one of the characteristics of uh, a modern Habsburg historiography um, uh, has been a degree of what I might describe as legitimist nostalgia. Um, that is to say, uh, uh, a variety of very prominent uh, Habsburg historians, including those based in the United States of America, have had familial associations mm -hmm. with service to the, uh, uh, the Habsburg dynasty, either through the bureaucracy or the army or through other the buttressing institutions of the state. I think this is interesting from all sorts of perspectives. Um, a lot of very, very important work has arisen from this kind of territory. Um, it's interesting because it, uh, I hope that it feeds back, there is a feedback loop into my argument about the ways in which the Habsburg state and as a corollary the United Kingdom state, the British state, uh, are supported by one tends I think to overlook the existence of these institutions. Uh, uh, they are the elephants in the room of the historiography of the British Union. Uh, and it's only comparatively <coughs> lately that, uh, uh, that each of these have begun to be kind of uh, re-examined, and I'll get to that perhaps in a moment. But yes, it seems to me that there's a degree of uh, legitimist nostalgia within, uh, uh, within some of the literature. Though this has been, uh, again, forgive my outsider's perspective, this has been revivified in the context of the European Union because of course the Habsburg, we can now view the Habsburg state uh, not as contemporaries did uh, uh, as the prison of the nations, but rather as infinitely better and infinitely preferable to that which came afterwards. And we can also perhaps view um, uh, no doubt with a degree of tendentiousness, the Habsburg uh, 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 Empire as, in terms of its ideals rather than its always its actuality, uh, uh, we can see it as a supranational kind of concert of the nations um, uh, in a way which prefigures the European Union. And to some extent, Peter Judson's work in particular has been seen uh, in Brexit Britain insofar as uh, uh, Brexiteers have commented upon it as, uh, as committed to, to that particular perspective on contemporary Europe. Um, is there a comparable nostalgist literature within Ireland? Well, actually, do you know what? I would suggest that there is. Um, um, it's there, uh, it's, uh, it's actually visible, uh, but it's, as is so often the case in Ireland, it is, uh, it is more complex and there is still pushback. Uh, the great thing uh, in writing about uh, uh, the Habsburg Empire from the point of view of Habsburg historians and even outsiders myself uh, uh, turning into this literature is that the Habsburg Empire is safely dead and uh, the national disputes that fired uh, such bitterness uh, 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 before uh, 1918 uh, uh, have been to some extent diffused and one can, one can argue, as Judson has argued, uh, 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 lyrically about the, uh, the overall successes and reformability of the empire. Uh, that there is a nostalgist 
take, I think, on aspects of the Irish Union as well. So, um, one of the one of the benefits of being as ancient as I am is that uh, teaching at UCD uh, as a very junior lecturer um, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, I, I witnessed the shift at that time within. Uh, uh, popular Irish attitudes and, and the attitudes of the Irish state towards the First World War, towards service within the British Crown forces during the First World War, until approximately the 1980s with the passing of the revolutionary, well, the, the leadership of the revolutionary generation. Um, uh, the First World War was John Redmond's war, or it was the British Empire's war. Uh, the fact that 30,000 Irish people, uh, uh, of whom a very significant number were Irish nationalists and Irish Catholics. The fact that 30,000 uh, Irish people had died in the First World War was, uh, was allowed it or, or glossed over. It was a rediscovery at that time, and I saw it at UCD, and I saw it in my classes in speaking about this period when students would come up to me and say, well, I had you know, one grandfather who fought with the IRA in 1919 to 1921, but I had another grandfather who uh, was uh, a soldier in the Dublin Fusiliers or the Monster Fusiliers or these other disbanded regiments of the British Army, uh, regiments that were disbanded in 1922 as Irish independence. So um, there was a revisiting and a, and a nostalgic revisiting, I think, on the part of those who had direct familial connections with, British, uh, with the British Army during the First World War. Um, and in a sense, uh, you know, this was at the time very surprising and very shocking, but uh, for some very shocking. Uh, but um, um, now, in 2024, this has been normalized. So, uh, um, so in the 1990s, you know, we had uh, President McAleese and Queen Elizabeth uh, unveiling the, the shared memorial to the Irish division at Messines in, uh, in Flanders and Belgium. Uh, and there have been, and, and now it's, it's a routine matter for even Irish Republicans from within the Sinn Féin tradition to acknowledge that sacrifice. But what we take as normative now is it's about a revisiting, uh, a, 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 a rediscovery of a, a familial and an intimate past that very many Irish people uh, have. Um, the other aspect of this perhaps relates, uh, and this is more difficult and more controversial and still, I think, uh, still uh, problematic, but the other aspect of this that uh, occurs to me uh, relates to the Royal Irish Constabulary. So the Royal Irish Constabulary uh, pre-1922 is uh, overwhelmingly um, a Catholic and a soft nationalist, a, a soft home rule enterprise. Um, in the very highest ranks, as the work of Fergus Campbell and others has made clear, uh, the, the very highest ranks are disproportionately Protestant and Unionist, but, but you have to get to the level of maybe district inspector, certainly county inspector, for that, uh, uh, that sort of shift in political and religious colouring to occur. Lots and lots of Irish people have uh, uh, now great grandfathers in the Royal Irish Constabulary, and this actually raised its head during the decade of centenaries. And um, if uh, I am remembering correctly, uh, there was a proposal to include uh, within the commemorations of the fallen Irish people of the War of Independence or the Revolutionary Period. Generally, there was a proposal to commemorate uh, those members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, i.e., the one of the key crown forces in Ireland, uh, and this was actively pursued. There was extreme pushback, and the and the issue uh, ultimately became toxic, and the government and the uh, I think the relevant commemoration committee walked away from it in the end. But it's a it's it's uh, uh, I think an example of an area where there is a, a degree of 
popular Irish investment. There's also, of course, a, a, a very considerable degree of popular Irish pushback. But my guess would be that as time melts away, that uh, there will be a, a, an even wider revisiting of that particular service tradition uh, uh, than has already occurred. Um, you can tell immediately that you provoked me into areas which I find endlessly fascinating um, uh, and I could go on at, uh, at much greater length about this, but you've also asked another question about, uh, uh, about Bosnia um, and the, uh, 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 the Austro-Hungarian, uh, uh, the different kind of stages of the annexation of uh, Bosnia, um, and um, I, uh, I'm not altogether sure where I want to go with this. Um, I think that uh, uh, at one level, the, uh, the Balkans bear some passing resemblance to the kind of political religious divisions within Ireland itself, so that's perhaps one possible route of travel. Um, the, um, you know, it's also the case that within Bosnia, the Habsburg state uh, has, as I was arguing in the uh, in the, the Metapai lecture, the Habsburg state has favoured partners within Bosnia, uh, uh, including uh, the church. Uh, and it encourages migration uh, within Bosnia as well, which disrupts the uh, established frontiers, if you like, socio-economic and political and religious frontiers of Bosnia. Um, and to that, you know, and, and that dynamism, if I can call it that, is also, I think, relevant to the British state in Ireland in the 19th century, where the expansion of the state and uh, expansion of its bureaucracy also have a disruptive set of impacts. Um, I think as well there maybe is an issue wherein um, uh, complex multinational states need, this was a, a criticism, uh, a contemporary criticism of the Habsburg Empire, they need, they need a unifying other. Uh, the war, uh, uh, or I should say the annexation of Bosnia and the suppression of uh, opposition there supplies that other. Um, I think that perhaps is relevant to the, uh, the complex United Kingdom state as well. Um, again, I could go on at some length on this theme and I perhaps have said enough, but I could speak on that. Guy, thank you. Um, maybe just a quick one for, for, for Eric. If you look, talk about historians' nostalgia, where I think you find it more than anything else would be actually among a group of historians, not, not across the board, a nostalgia for the counterfactual of what would have happened had Redmond had the opportunity to develop home rule within the Union, how that could have led a different history. That is a definitely a kind of a nostalgia you feel yes. on the soft side. Um, the other point that I think really comes out very strongly from your talk, even more than in the book, and it sharpened a point for me, was the notion to which union and unions are not something static. It's not a moment, it's a dynamic. It's constantly being reworked through. I think it came, it's driven home to me when you bring that quote from that great uh, Italian novel, that Peduza's novel, where he says, in order to keep what we have, we have to change it. The only way of keeping it is to keep moving. And that's where unions fail. Because unionists preserve the moment. They reify the moment and they miss what union is about, that it's a dynamic and not static. That, that's, I think, is, is the real insight there. But, but the question I wanted to ask you is one for, the, for us as Irish studies here. When reading your book, what is really astounding is your engagement with historiography. Beyond the, the, the engagement with primary sources, it's the engagement of this broad reading. I found myself constantly First of all, annoyed by the fact that you didn't use footnotes, that you used parentheses, I had to look and dig up these things each time. But constantly finding that I had to read more and more and more to understand these contexts. You're referring us all the time. What would be your recommendation to students here and to historians, not just students, to all of us, to me, to all of us? 
in challenging us to engage with these comparative perspectives? What does it require from us in terms of rethinking, retooling ourselves methodologically? Clearly, we have to read a lot. Clearly, we can't read in the vernaculars a lot of what we want to read. So we have to read it as it's mediated in often in different terms. But even though you engage in different moments in vernaculars, it's quite clear when you say, is it Sweden, Norway, or Norway, Sweden? It depends on who, which text you're reading. In defining the name of the kingdoms, even. So what does that require? What did it require of you? I mean, you, you, it took you years to write this book, so clearly it's, it's a very demanding task. Mm. Uh, great, great questions and great points. Um, so um, I absolutely agree about the Redmondite uh, uh, nostalgia. So um, we've, uh, you know, we saw, I think, a degree of that uh, in the 1990s. Um, and indeed, I think there's a variety of centrist historians who, um, who uh, um, continue to return to uh, uh, the Redmondite moment and wonder, you know, uh, wonder in uh, not as a uh, not in an intellectually detached, but I think in an emotionally committed way. Uh, uh, what would have happened? The lives that would have been spared, the toxicity that would have been. Uh, uh, sidestepped, perhaps, you know, had the Redmondite uh, vision uh, prevailed, would Redmond's home rule have provided, at the risk of an anachronism, the freedom to achieve freedom uh, 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 before Collins enunciated uh, uh, that dictum in the context uh, of the treaty? So one sees that, uh, one sees that, uh, uh, I think, clearly, and I absolutely agree with you uh, on that. Um, union as dynamic, yes, that's emphatically, I think, part of the uh, part of the enterprise. Um, um, in terms of my scene setting within the book, uh, I do what historians uh, do. That is to say, I set out my stall seeking to. Um, define my terms as uh, sharply and as coherently uh, 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 as I can. But actually, um, I came to the conclusion uh, that um, union is, uh, is a dynamic, it's a process. Uh, it's also characterized by ambiguity. And that may sound, uh, and perhaps is to some extent, a cop out. But I would suggest to you that uh, that actually uh, uh, the way in which unions operate necessarily embraces ambiguity. These are multinational, complex polities, wherein the more precise your definitions, the less likely you are to achieve the sort of pragmatic agreement that is necessary to keep the enterprise on the road. So uh, all of the uh, uh, Irish historians uh, uh, complain about the ambiguity of the union document itself. They complain, of course, about the, uh, the ambiguities of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, uh, not least over reference the Boundary Commission, but not least of all, it's, it's treatment of partition. But this is in the nature of these union relationships that you fudge, you, uh, you smudge the lines in order to get the deal, whether in actually drawing the enterprise together or in deconstructing it at the end and seeking to kind of uh, uh, revivify it in some uh, uh, renewed way. So not only is union a, a dynamic, it, it, it is an ambiguous concept wherein ambiguity is at the heart of the enterprise itself. It's a necessary part of the enterprise. My advice to uh, uh, my advice to uh, the young. Um, uh, well, not for the first time uh, this evening. I think uh, I, uh, I uh, turned this weapon on myself at the beginning by referring to the fact that I was Burns scholar here. Uh, not only in the last century, but in the last millennium. Um, um, uh, I don't wish to uh, be uh, kind of particularly uh, um, 
pedagogic or tendentious here. Um, um, I am going to say simply that my advice to graduate students and uh, doctoral students uh, in thinking about a topic is uh, to do something that inflames and excites your interests and passion. You are going to be committing yourself. Uh, I committed a huge amount of time to this book. Um, and uh, in the first instance, uh, this is a awful confession to make, particularly with the camera sitting on me. <laughs> uh, in the first instance, the book was written for me because um, I think to commit to a project that lasts uh, a significant number of years, you have to live and drink and eat that subject. And you as postgraduate students have to do that as well. Uh, and yes, I think it is important to lift your eyes above uh, your kind of particular sectional or niche literature. It's important to be aware of uh, uh, wider debates and it's important to engage uh, uh, the full set of the skills that you have linguistically otherwise, but above all, you're committing a significant part of your life to this enterprise, and you've got to love it. You've really got to love it. Thank you very much for that, Alvin. That's great. Uh, Catherine, I think we're out of time. You can, you can go up to, uh, to speak with, uh, with Alvin there, because... Fine. Thank you very much.